uh, his wife shot. Another man who shot them uh, committed suicide. All of this inside the walls of the Vatican. The killing, the first inside the walls of the Vatican in our living memory. I guess there may have been uh, 150 years ago something may have happened. And we were talking about that before the break. Just an incredible, incredible occurrence. And Father Martin began to say that Pope John Paul, I think uh, this bears repeating um, and and uh, some and trying to understand, Father uh, Pope John Paul sure. has been in some way affected himself. It must be a cause of great anguish for him. Well, you, you you said that, but you said that he went to a, a voodoo. Uh, now I'm I'm not really caught up on this, Father. Well, he he went to Haiti. Haiti he had a, trip, a papal trip to Haiti. And during that trip, he met officially with the head of the, I think it's 15,000 voodoo priests that live in Haiti, and sat down with him. We have the photograph, but I have it here in my files. And one of the things he said was, uh, with typical John Paul II ecumenism, look, we are interested in your doctrine, and we think you should be interested in our Catholic doctrine. Um, uh, how? I know, I know. It leaves you, it leaves you speechless. Uh, or, it, that's right. Uh, or, for instance, uh, in years that passed, when he went to India, John Paul II permitted a young lady in a sari uh, to put the sign of Kali on his forehead with that red stain. And he sat in a chair chosen by the Indian bishops, which had the phallic shape. As you know, the phallus is worshipped in, in in Hinduism. Why? Uh, why? Well, it, this, these were actions of John Paul II destined to create a, a, a great fellowship and feeling. For instance, let me give you an example which struck us all at the time and is not mentioned because people are afraid of being called anti-Semites. Uh, John Paul II went for the first time a pope as a pope he went to the synagogue in Rome. The head of the synagogue is a very respectable rabbi called Elio Toaf, mm -hmm. very well known to all of us. And um, they sat on, on a stage, or a bema, as they call it in Hebrew, uh, on two chairs, uh, sort of uh, catty corner facing themselves and facing the audience. And in his speech, which is a very good speech, but a very good address, John Paul II said, his only reference uh, was, oh, well, by the way, you know our founder was of your race. <laughs> that's, oh. all his, that's all the testimony to Jesus that John Paul II gave. And oh. when, when, the, when his Vatican held a special Holocaust evening, which was standing room only, it was such a grand affair, with music and with uh, a huge menorah lit by the grandchildren of people who had uh, who had survived Auschwitz and Dachau and Birkenau, the Hitler camps. Um, in his speech for that for that for, for that particular evening, uh, which was a Holocaust evening, John Paul II consented to have the only crucifix in the hall removed. Uh, in order not to offend his Jewish friends. Uh, well, we consider that. Uh, for me to remark that it's not anti-Semitism on my part. I've done more, I think, for Jewish-Christian relations than most people alive. That's the story you and I have never uh, delved into, which we will ask another broadcast, please God. But the fact we find this, um, no pope before John the Twenty-Third, before John Paul II, would have allowed it. If a cardinal did that under any of the other popes, the cardinal would be sent away to live life out in a monastery on the top of the Sierra Madre. Why has John Paul done it? It is his form of ecumenism. And look, let me make quite clear, Art, for you and for everybody listening. This man is my pope. He does represent Christ. He is the vicar of Christ for me. And if you were to speak... Under the conditions of infallibility, I will accept what he says. But I am allowed, nay, I am obliged, 
by my tradition and my faith and by previous popes to critique anybody, priest, bishop, cardinal, or pope, when I think they are in error. Uh, so, 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 so a pope then, the, the, the pope, now I'm not a Catholic, my wife is, but the pope is supposed to be, is he not infallible? Only under certain conditions. Help, help, certain help, help conditions. me understand what conditions those would the be, in other words. This. He must state explicitly, as follows, put it in my language, uh, paraphrase it but accurately, what I'm about to tell you is something... I say, as the successor of Peter, and I say it with the authority of Christ as his vicar on earth, to be held by all the faithful as a matter of profound, divine, Roman Catholic faith. He must say that. Now, John Paul II has never said that about anything, even about the ordination of men and women. So then he, he, he can do that on, on the one hand, though he hasn't done it, and on the other can sit down with a voodoo priest. That's right, that's right. And in his, his famous encyclical, which has become so popular with progressive Catholics, it's called Ut Unum Sint, that they may be one. He discussed and outlined the way he would like to uh, take apart the whole doctrine of the Pope's primacy in order to suit non-Catholics. So John Paul II has ventured out along the edges of orthodoxy in his statements and uh, in his preaching. But in, whenever he taught, he has never yet taught error infallibly. He's never adopted the infallible mode. The infallible mode is something where the Pope says, I am now doing this as the head of all Catholics. I'm uh, doing it as the successor of Peter and it's to be held by all the faithful under pain of mortal sin. He has never done that yet. Do you uh, think, do you think, he's of course very frail now, very old. He's very frail, he's very he's frail and it, it makes you cry to see his face. Uh, he is, his left eye is recalcitrant, he can't keep it open or shut. His hand, his left hand is jigging continuously. Yes. He doesn't look at you straight in the eye because he's bent over. And by the way, I know a man who frequents him about every six weeks from New York. And he says that surrounding John Paul II in his court, in his entourage, the hate is palpable. The hate. The hate is hate. palpable? Hate is palpable. Now, now, Father, when you heard about murder hours ago in the Vatican, were you surprised? No. You were not surprised? No. No, I'm not surprised. I'm appalled. Of course, and shocked, because two people, three people's lives were snuffed out uh, by violence. And um, but I know that we will. In my lifetime, I may not know the real facts behind it all. Um, and moment of insanity is a beautiful expression in Italian, but tells me nothing about the reality. But surprise? No, I'm not. Surprised. Well, when you said that the. Pope's entourage, the, 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 the feeling of hate was palpable, uh, hate of this, the Pope, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hate of man, the Pope? Yes, and this, of this particular Pope. And this man, by the way, is not, is not a Christian. I, I beg your pardon? He's not a Christian. He's a technocrat who goes to the Vatican for a certain reason, periodically. And uh, he, he says you can't mistake the, the hate and dislike of this man in his immediate entourage. And so John Paul II is a pathetic figure, really. Uh, he, he lives with this night and day. Um, there is no mercy for him. There is no compassion for him in his normal entourage. And uh, he is spurned by the Patriarch of Constantinople and he's laughed at by the Patriarch of, of uh, Moscow. And he's let down by his cardinals and his bishops, uh, he is an outcast, this Pope. And it, it makes me cry to know what he's going through. And yet, he, he has done things which we must criticize and will criticize in all trust and belief that he is our Pope, but has made mistakes. Now, the, the point in general about these killings, these, these, the, 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 the murder 
and uh, suicide in the Vatican is that my point was that it's in his watch this has taken place and he knows it. He's a responsible man and he knows that this has taken place during his watch and that therefore somehow or other he is responsible. He is responsible. Would you and expect a statement from the Pope? No. No. Oh, he might make a reference uh, every Wednesday, as you know, when he's, in, when he's at all in good shape. He gives a little sermonette from the window, from the, one of the windows on the fourth floor of his apartment in the Apostolic Palace, out to the crowd. There always is a crowd on Wednesday to listen to him. He may make some uh, general reference which people will pick up on as a reference to this calamity. Because, believe you me, Art, ecclesiastically, papally, this is a disaster. There's no doubt about it. And this is a sign of the times.